Hey guys, I'm really excited. I have Dan Buglio with me over in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Dan is a mind body coach who works with people to help them to eliminate pain and other symptoms through education on how the brain and pain and human system works. And this is right now my absolute all time favorite topic because so many people I interview are telling me how much success they're getting um, from focusing on these types of approaches. Uh, just so many people are eliminating so much suffering from their life and getting so much quality of life back by understanding this brain body connection and just how this whole human system uh, is set up. So really exciting stuff today. I think this is such a worthwhile investment of time to learn as much as we can about this. So stick around to the end because we're be going to be covering some, some really helpful stuff. So Dan, thank you. Welcome. I really appreciate you doing this today. Yeah, I appreciate your time and asking me to be on your show. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so how did you get into this? What made you interested in this topic to first, in the first place? Uh, 13 years of chronic back pain and sciatica, sciatica myself. And I was able to end it with a mind-body approach, originally uh, discovered by Dr. John Sarno. You may have heard that name. Um, and so I was fascinated by it. Uh, I was convinced that it was what was going on for me. But I got rid of this pain well before Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, podcasts, and all that kind of stuff. I had to do it with books and trying to figure it out. And so made every mistake known to man and woman and just kind of had to fumble through it. Um, once I got through it, I also got into marketing for other reasons. And I was saying, well, I could combine my marketing and then help people. And so I just kept on studying, learning growing and about four years ago I started teaching this stuff online and uh, I've been doing it every day since and uh, yeah I, I just love helping people and you know it's all a mind body concept it's I've talked to quite a few people who have um, read Dr. Sarno's books and had amazing progress with their health as a result so for people who aren't familiar with his work or what that looks like. Dr. Sarno's original theory was that the brain perceived repressed emotions, primarily anger and rage, as dangerous. And it would create something physical like pain to distract us from those dangerous emotions, right? So that was the theory. Now, I don't think that's the only reason why people have chronic pain. Unfortunately, because that was Sarno's theory, there's a whole legion of people who are proceeding with trying to recover from chronic pain by going back and looking for all their repressed emotions, doing trauma work, doing therapy, doing journaling, and doing all these things to try to find that long lost emotion that's causing all the problems. Um, what I've done is I've said, well, maybe it's not emotions. I mean, it could be that somebody had an illness or an injury or life events going on. All sorts of things can kind of culminate in the brain creating symptoms. And I've kind of summarized it that perceived danger is what turns on the alarm signals in the brain. And so perceived danger could be emotions. So Sarno's right. But it could also be like somebody had a surgery and they were freaked out that it might not heal right. And as a result of all of the fear and the attention they gave to the pain after surgery, the surgery healed, but the pain never went away. It became chronic. And there's infinite numbers of examples of how these things can manifest. Um, but in my opinion, perceived danger is the problem. Safety is the solution. And I really try to keep it simple there. I don't think we have to go digging up the long lost emotions or any of that stuff. I think it's like, all right, our brain is turning on signals because it's perceiving danger. So how do we teach it? that those signals aren't needed because we're not truly in danger. So that's my whole approach is based on Sarno's work, but I've kind of expanded a little bit to be more of a danger response than a purely emotional, psychological thing. And I think this is something that's starting to make a lot of sense to a lot of people because the people that I interview, you know, cause I do a lot of recovery stories here. And when people share their story, a lot of it starts out something similar, but not exactly the same. It's, like I had a virus or I was in a really stressful job or I was overtraining for ultra marathons or I was in a really toxic relationship or I was in a car accident, I had a surgery, you know, something, a major 
uh, or a, a whole perfect storm of things. And then one final thing seemed to push them over the edge. So mm -hmm. there is definitely, from what you're saying resonates from what people are telling me is that there is some sort of danger response. And it makes sense why, because I do get people saying like, I don't really have any trauma. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, how do I heal myself? <laughs> you know, it can be very confusing. Yeah. I, again, you know, I, I think the danger is the problem. It's not even a problem. It's just the brain doing what it's supposed to do, which is to keep us safe and alive. This is not, you're not emotionally damaged. You're not mentally ill. You're certainly not physically damaged, you know, and I think our brain and nervous system, there's a lot of talk about, you know, nervous systems being all out of whack and dysregulated and I've got to heal my nervous system. And I don't think our brain or our nervous system is malfunctioning. I think it's working perfectly. I just really think it is operating on misinformation and fear. The belief that I'm broken, the belief that I'm sick, the belief that I won't heal, the belief that something. And um, yeah, that misinformation and fear is what causes the brain to loop on that fear, symptom, fear, symptom loop. And things can become chronic. But I think our brains and nervous systems are working flawlessly. They're just amplified. Yeah, I've read something recently similar, and that made a lot of sense. It was that, you know, we're not broken. Our bodies aren't broken. This is a perfectly natural and normal response to an mm -hmm. abnormal environment because the world that we live in looks nothing like the one that we evolved to thrive in. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it was never designed to deal with all of these things that we're dealing with, all of the input, all of the stressors, being constantly connected, knowing about every war, every death in the world, you know, just have so many things coming at us. Right. You know, it's the same thing with a lot of the ways that we think that our bodies are malfunctioning. Like we talk about the obesity epidemic. And once again, it's just our bodies doing what they were designed to do. They're a normal reaction to an abnormal environment. You know, we shouldn't be able to get whatever food we want instantly. <laughs> Cause we had to make a cake every time we wanted a piece of cake, we'd probably eat less of it. So it's just, it's just nice. Um, um, hearing this, uh, cause it can be very discouraging when you're chronically ill, thinking that you're in a body that's malfunctioning and that it's broken. So like, how do I fix a broken body? Whereas if you're like, no, it's, it's working fine. We just have to, you know, kind of deal with the, the, the danger and the safety issues and kind of teach it how to navigate this yeah. world and that it, you are safe and you are okay. And it doesn't need to, you know, tramp you down and trap you in pain and fatigue to keep you safe. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's talk about that because some people, depending upon their worldview might be like, but how can I ever get rid of my symptoms? Because the world is not safe. How am I supposed to get better? So I think we focus on safety on the things that are within our influence, our emotional safety, our, our physical safety, our mental safety. We don't need universal global safety because we know the world is kind of messed up these days. Um, but within the areas that are within our influence, I think it matters because we experience the world three ways, maybe four, emotional, physical, mental. And many people have a spiritual state. I don't get into that because I don't want to be preachy or say that you need that in order to get what you don't. I mean, I got better before I had a spiritual side. Um, but we can all agree that we all have an emotional state, a physical state, and a mental state, whether you're a year old or 90 years old. And so if we can feel safer in those three areas, guess what happens? The brain and nervous system settles down. Well, what, can train, what controls the nervous system? The brain. So if we teach the brain that we're safe emotionally, physically, mentally, and that we're not actually broken or diseased or, you know, whatever other labels we may have gotten from the medical or psychological world, then the brain can settle down. And, you know, this absolutely impacts things like mental health. Anxiety, depression, OCD, PTSD. Those are all just things, symptoms of a brain perceiving danger. And so to me, perceived danger is the, you know, the canary in the coal mine and safety is, you know, the solution. It makes sense why so many people are having success with these different brain training types of programs mm -hmm. and why, and I don't think this is the answer for everybody, for every condition. I'm not saying that, but there's no denying that 
a lot of people are allevi- alleviating symptoms by using these approaches. And it's having these messages, mm-hmm. you know, that you repeat and tell to yourself over and over and over um, throughout the day, um, you know, sort of teaching that safety to the brain, um, to your point that you don't have to change the world around you. It's just changing your response to it and how you cope with it, which exactly. is why I'm trying to put out, this is my number one mission right now, I'd say, is just to put out as many of these strategies as possible. Because not everyone resonates for everyone. You know, some people do one program and it doesn't fit, um, you know, but there are lots of options out there. And sometimes one will just be like, yes, this is a good fit. This feels right for me. And um, it, people just take mm-hmm. off with it. From your approach in working with people, how does this, what does this look like or what is a good place to start? I speak about four fundamental or foundational items. Uh, number one, the first foundational piece is what causes pain or other symptoms. And I just spoke about it. Perceived danger is what causes symptoms. The brain's job is to warn us that something bad is going on. It could be pain, any other, you know, hundreds of other symptoms. So first foundational piece is what causes it. The second foundational piece is, does this actually apply to me? Right? The, is this what's going on for me? And there are assessments that are available that you can kind of say, well, how are my symptoms behaving? Because people say, Dan, I've got this, this, and that medical diagnosis. Is that TMS? And the answer is always, well, let's see how the, the symptoms are behaving. That's much more important than what medical label you've been given. So do the symptoms change in any way, shape, or form? So they show up on a schedule. I feel better in the morning, but worse at night. Um, Do the symptoms ever move? Do I feel better when I'm less stressed? Do I feel worse when I'm more stressed? These are characteristics of the brain creating the symptoms and not the structural physical problem or illness. Because structural problems don't go on holiday when you're on vacation. You would hurt the same every time. So there are very specific characteristics that you can rule in the mind body as the cause. So that's what I do. What causes it? Does this apply to me? Go through the assessments. What the doctors told you may or may not be relevant, but we certainly don't rule in TMS by looking at the label that you were given. We've got a lot of people who are mislabeled as broken when in fact this work actually gets them out of symptoms and pain. Can you Um, explain TMS for people who aren't familiar? Well, that was Dr. Sarno's theory that I touched on earlier. So TMS stands for tension myositis syndrome. That was Dr. Sarno's theory that it involved myo means muscle. Tension, of course, and syndrome is just a whole host of problems. He then named it tension myoneural syndrome because he figured it also involved the nerves. Um, and then late in his career, he was calling it the mind-body syndrome, TMS. Uh, There's people who uh, just call it casually too much stress, right? And so, which is fairly appropriate. Um, So TMS, that's what it came from. Uh, I don't really like, I use the term TMS because that's what everybody knows it as, at least in my community. Um, But I've been using the the, the term perceived danger pain or perceived danger symptoms or perceived danger response because I think it's more descriptive. It says what it is right on the outside of the box, as opposed to, oh, I think you have TMS, and people are like, I don't know what that means. Oh, you have perceived danger pain. They can at least look at the words and go, you know, I, I, I see where you're getting at. And so I think labeling it something that's useful is better than using TMS moniker. I like that assessment piece of it because it's very confusing for people. How do I know if this is, you know, a mind body, a brain body situation? And just looking at those things like, do I have more energy? Do I feel better when I'm happier? (laughs) Um, You know, lots of, I interviewed a doctor recently who was saying lots of her patients said that when they went on holiday, they got better and all their symptoms almost completely went away. And they thought it was like the air or the proximity to the ocean or, and she's like, no, I think just your stress is gone. (laughs) less perceived danger because they don't have yeah. to get up and get to work and take care yeah. of it and, that and everything else. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you said you dealt a lot or you deal a lot with uh, fatigue, correct? Yes. So my, my perception on fatigue is that when the brain gets overwhelmed, when the brain gets fatigued, the brain says, life's too intense. Go take a nap. And I'm joking a little bit, but 
in essence, when the brain is overwhelmed or fatigued, it can create the fatigue in the body almost instantly, sometimes, in a way to protect us from the overwhelm. Because I've seen just as many people who have that overwhelming fatigue come out of it when they're on vacation or um, when they just make a mindset shift to say, okay, yeah, I'm feeling the fatigue. It's in the morning. So instead of laying in bed worrying about I'm too tired to do anything, I'm going to get up. I'm going to put some music on. I'm going to get out in the sunshine and, and like just make a mindset shift that I'm actually okay. And in many cases, the fatigue can lift. And so, you know, we've seen that type of response that it's the brain controlling the fatigue. It's not the adrenals. It's not the energy level, the mitochondria, the sun, the vitamin D, the water, the, you know, the 42 other things that you, you're chasing when trying to cure this chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I still believe it's the brain. I still believe it's a mindset game. It's recovering from the fear as opposed to trying to solve it from a microbiology standpoint. Because most of your audience or much of your audience has probably tried all that stuff and it's still stuck in bed and saying, I can only do 16 minutes of walking, but if I do 17, I'm going to crash for a week. And some of that is the language in the community that's perpetuating the fear that if I do too much, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for anybody who's hearing that, please no disrespect, because I know those are your experiences. But what is the actual cause? Was it literally an extra minute of exertion that exhausted your body? Or was it the perception that I can only do this much and I did this much? And the fear that surrounds that and the fear of those previous crashes, which are legitimate and real, nobody's making this stuff up. But again, it all, to me, it points back to perceived danger as what's driving things as opposed to, you know, a physiologic response due to too much or too little or not enough or too little energy or whatever. There definitely seems to be a lot of overlap um, from the people that I'm talking to, resources out there for people that are meant, you know, supposed to be for chronic pain or helping people recover from chronic fatigue as well. From, you know, Dr. Sarno's work to using things like uh, the Curable app. Um, sure. They're using it for the fatigue and, and they're having, at least some people are having really great results. So it's really interesting to see. Because how we're, all talking about, we're all talking about the same thing. The symptoms yeah. are different. But the symptoms almost don't matter. My back pain is somebody else's fatigue. It's somebody else's neck pain. It's somebody else's migraine. It's somebody else's reflux. It's all coming from a brain that is turning on a warning signal to say, danger. And if you can teach the brain that we're actually okay through whatever methods or programs or uh, belief systems, the brain will turn down the alarm systems because... I view a lot of these symptoms, most of the symptoms, as false alarms. There's nothing actually wrong. You're not broken. You just thought you were. What are some of the best ways you've come across to teach your brain that it's safe? Well, I don't know if I finished the four foundation ones. I don't know. Oh, number apologies. One, <laughs> number one was what causes symptoms. Number two is does it apply to me, to the assessments? Mm -hmm. Number three is is there a cure? We're actually speaking about the cure. And number four, which is really the tricky one, is do I have what it takes to implement this cure? Because a lot of people are like, yeah, I believe that applies for other people. I, I believe that's what's causing my symptoms. But I don't know if I've got what it takes to do this. I'm too anxious. I'm too scared. I've had the symptoms for too long, too fearful. I think too much. And we can talk ourselves out of implementing what appears to be a fairly simple approach. Didn't say it's easy, but simple. Um, so I think building that foundation is really key because without that, it's going to be really hard to teach your brain that you're safe. Because if you don't know what causes symptoms in the first place, good luck teaching the brain to turn them off. If you don't think it applies to you, good luck turning, turning them off. If you don't think you're capable of doing this, good luck turning them off. And so I think that's foundational. Start there. Once you know that you're okay, this applies to you and you have what it takes to teach your brain you're safe, then we get into things like, well, how do I teach myself I'm safe emotionally, physically, mentally? 
your emotion. Feel your emotions. Don't judge yourself. Don't ruminate on the reasons why you're upset. Because if we ruminate on why we're upset, the emotions never pass. We keep ourselves in that emotional state for a long time. You ever have an argument in your head driving your car or somebody that you had a difficulty with two weeks ago? Next time I see them, I'm going to tell them this. I should have said that. You know, we're ruminating and we're getting upset over and over again. So feel the emotion. Don't judge yourself for having the emotion. Don't ruminate on the story. You know the story. Just allow yourself to feel it so the emotion can pass. Over time, your brain will say, wow, emotions are safe. We don't need to turn on symptoms when we get highly emotional. Next step is physical. When we are perceiving danger, what's our normal physical state? Tight, tension, breathing shallow, right? So if your shoulders are hanging out with your earlobes, you're probably in a physical state of perceiving danger. So it's an awareness thing and a decision to go, oh, I'm feeling tight, tense, I'm relax my body. So I can breathe as opposed to Let's do breath work for 10 minutes to fix this problem. Because I think some of those things the brain perceives is like, why is Dan doing all this breath work? There must be a problem he's trying to fix, right? Same thing with meditation. Same thing with any number of healing modalities. If we've got three hours worth of protocol we do every day to try to recover, our brain's looking at us going, Dan's doing all this weird stuff. Why? There must be a problem. Better stay alert. Right? So... I think a very simple approach is when we're tight and tense, the brain has no choice but to perceive danger. When the brain, or when we're, our body is relaxed and we're breathing comfortably, the brain has no choice but to perceive safety. What happens to the person on vacation when they're sitting on their on the beach chair with their feet in the sand? They're relaxed. They're breathing comfortably. The brain goes, "Oh, they're safe." And so I think that's the very simplistic way of teaching the brain that we're safe physically to be in a relaxed body, breathing comfortably, instead of this, breathing shallow. Um, and the last thing is the mental state, right? Because these are the three ways we experience life, emotionally, mentally, physically. So mental, are we feeling safe when we are spiraling on fearful, worrisome thoughts? And what if this happens? What if that happens? I can't do this, can't do that. If I do too much, this is going to happen. That's not a, a state of mental safety, is it? So a lot of people think, all right, I got to stop those negative thoughts. Well, we can't. We have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. And if we're in a bad state and we've got symptoms, we're going to have negative thoughts. Other people go, all right, I got to fix those thoughts. Let me catch the thoughts and reframe them. You know, and I think even certain programs are all about no negative thoughts at all, right? Which is very unrealistic. So we don't have to fix the negative thoughts because we'd be exhausted by 8.30 in the morning because we have so many thoughts and if we had to catch them and fix them, impossible. My approach is generally, you can notice the thoughts, but they don't have to have anything on them. You don't have to believe them because most negative fearful thoughts are just coming out of what? A scared brain, perceiving danger. Hey, be careful, don't do this, don't do that. Last time you did this, this was a problem. Don't you remember what you heard or read on the forum and? It's all just coming from a brain doing what? Perceiving danger. So if we allow those thoughts and say, I'm not going to think about that now. I don't need to. Because you know what causes symptoms. You know it applies to you. You know there's a cure and you know you're capable of it. Well, then why do I have to buy into all these fearful thoughts going, oh, no, we're in trouble. You have the foundation built, right? And so I think it's really important to just say, it's okay to have a negative thought. I don't have to fix it. Or I don't have to stop it. But I don't have to believe it or take it serious either. Why? Because I've got the foundation laid. Why would I be bothered by fearful thoughts if I truly know I'm okay and I can do this? So I, I just kind of simplify it into the core concepts. And um, yeah, it's all about teaching the brain I'm safe. Another really important way to teach the brain you're safe is choosing how you respond to symptoms in the first place. I think there's three responses to symptoms, right? One is ah, freak out. We've all done that. And I've never met anybody who got better by freaking out. Why? Because if this is a brain thing, freaking out just says to the brain, stay vigilant, keep the system activated. 
So freaking out, no, don't recommend it. Uh, I'll never say never freak out because we will. So freak out less. That's attainable. That's achievable. If you're used to freak out 14 times a day, tomorrow go to 12 or 13 and then a little bit less. And then if you notice yourself freaking out, pull yourself out of the freak out zone quicker. So you're doing it for less duration because some people will freak out first thing in the morning and that's their mental and emotional state all day long. And so shorten the duration, shorten the number of times. And how do you stop freaking out? You don't buy into the fearful thoughts because you can't freak out if you're not thinking those fearful thoughts. Think the fearful thoughts are what drags you into the emotions of fear, terror, anger, sadness, despair. Right? That's all combined in a freak out. So freak out less. Uh, the next way to respond to symptoms is calm reassurance. Like, all right, Dan, come on, we're good. I know it causes symptoms. I know that it applies to me. There's a cure and I know I can do it. So what am I freaking out about? I'm going to be good. These symptoms, they're all a false alarm. They're just a message from the brain that thinks something dangerous is happening. But as I look around, there's really no danger. I'm really okay. Right? And so that's calm reassurance. And if you're not sure if you can do that for anybody who's got kids, you ever have a scared kid? Yeah, come here, honey. I got you. You're going to be okay. Well, if we can reassure a scared kid, we can do it for ourselves. It's our responsibility to do it for ourselves. If you don't have kids, but you've ever had a scared dog on a thunderstorm, come here, puppy. I got you. You're good. Right? You bring your energy to where you want the dog's energy to be. And so reassuring ourselves is a big part of getting better because when you reassure yourself, you feel safer, don't you? As opposed to running around freaking out. And the ultimate response to symptoms is this. Don't care. So what? Whatever. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, nothing bad happened. So what? Right? And so those are the three responses. And the last thing to teach ourselves that we're safe is to stop fixing, to stop focusing on it, to stop fearing it, stop worrying about it, stop, stop researching it. You know what's causing the symptom. You know it applies to you. You're capable of doing it. So shift your attention towards engaging in the real world and life. Well, I don't know. I've been sick so long. That's all I think about. Okay. What would you think about if you weren't sick? What would you do if you weren't sick? Well, I can't get out of bed. Okay. You can lay in bed catastrophizing over your life, or you can lay in bed and watch silly cat videos or, you know, play Sudoku or do something engaging to get your brain out of suffering. So I think when you combine all this stuff, emotional safety, mental safety, physical safety, not really trying to fix your thinking, responding differently, engaging in life again, your brain has no choice but to go, look at Dan, look what he's doing. He, he must be okay. He's not concerned anymore. He's not panicking. He's not freaking out. He's not overthinking this. He's starting to do normal stuff. Holy cow. The brain notices all this and says, we can turn down the volume on the intensity of the brain and the nervous system. And the brain is the control center of the entire system. So if you can teach the brain that you're okay, guess what? The whole system can settle down. So I hope that makes sense. This is absolutely amazing, Dan. I'm so excited. You've explained this so well. And I think this is such valuable information that so many of us need. And you've just, you know, I think summarized well, because there's a lot of information about this out there and it can be overwhelming. And the, I, this, just, this just paints a really clear picture, um, you know, of what is happening in these sorts of situations. So yeah, I, I think this is so valuable and people are really going to appreciate it. If people wanted to learn more about the work that you do or um, connect with you and learn more, how would they do that? Well, I'm on Facebook and YouTube under the name Pain Free You. So if you search YouTube for Pain Free You channel, you'll find me. And I've got 1,500 videos plus. I do daily videos every day. So every morning at 5 a.m. Eastern time, uh, there's a new video posted. And it's just me talking about these concepts from 85 different angles. And, you know, some of it doesn't seem like it would relate to symptoms or pain. Um, but I always kind of connect the dots and say, you know, 
here's how not having the support from family can impact your recovery process and any number of topics. Um, so that's, there's that. I have a website, painfreeu.com. And so I have some resources there, some downloadables. There's a getting started page in the help menu. Um, and that's a good place to go to do the assessments that we talked about. There are some assessments there, two of them. One's a pain test, another one's an FIT assessment created by Dr. Schubner. Um, and those are a good place to get that second fundamental of does this apply to me? Take the assessments, it'll tell you pretty clearly. I offer a number of both free and paid resources to getting better. So I do have a group coaching program that's available on that getting started page. You can look at the website and see, um, but that's where we focus on successes, you know, positive stories of progress, as well as implementation advice. You know, it's not a symptom complaint department. We don't want to hear people complaining about symptoms, but we focus on the solution, which is a lot of what I just explained. I'm so glad you're out here doing what you do. Uh, as we all know, there are so many people in the world who are suffering that, um, you know, need this sort of support. Uh, with their health journey and all of this of course will be linked in the video description so for those of you watching i highly encourage you just to expand that description and take a look at what's there i, I believe it was people actually recommending dan to me is how i ended up connecting with him just like you have to get this guy on your channel um, because he really is putting out really helpful stuff so um a massive thank you dan to you for doing this today i really appreciate this i no exaggeration. I think this was pure gold and going to help. Um, you are helping and I'm glad to help put the word out about the work that you're doing. Well, I'm thrilled to be able to show up and, and talk to your audience. So it was a pleasure. Thank you. And to those of you watching, I know it can be a lot to take all of this in. So I have a link in my video description. If you're not already signed up, I put out a weekly newsletter and I summarize the highlights of these videos, kind of the key takeaways, because I know it can be a lot. <laughs> I also have hundreds of videos and you can't be expected to watch them all. So if you're not already there, um, I'd love for you to sign up and come join me there. So yeah, thank you uh, again, Dan. Thank you to those of you who are watching. Whatever you're facing, keep at it. Don't give up. I believe your answers are out there. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. And I hope to see you uh, in this next one.